Our uh, next speaker is uh, Drew McDonald. Drew is an orthodontic specialist and private practice owner in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His orthodontic practice has a strong focus on TMJ and airway focused treatment planning, as well as surgically facilitated orthodontic treatment. And essentially, he works with his, uh, with his team on complex interdisciplinary care for his patients. He attended uh, Creighton University for his dental school and his orthodontic residency at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He's received a master's degree in, um, for a thesis on sports mouth guard design and the effects of muscle forces and joint loading on the TM complex. He's in private practice. Uh, he was in private practice for general dentistry for three years before he did his uh, orthodontic specialist. Please welcome Drew McDonald. Story with you of, of what I do every day at my practice and quite honestly, what's a big part of every orthodontist practice uh, across the nation. Um, in terms of whenever I, I talk today, I want you to think of your orthodontist down the street and that these patients that I'm showing you are also the patients that they all see. And they're the patients that we all work together as an interdisciplinary team. Um, I know I'm talking about TMJ today and it's not a super sexy conversation or, or anything that we all get super excited about, all these TMJ patients. But what I really want to show you is how important this is and how important it is, not just to orthodontics, but to us all and how it helps us set up predictable treatment planning outcomes for our patients. Um, as we go forward, you see all these faces on the screen. These are all people that came to see me that were referred. Pretend you referred these patients to me. And you know they all have one thing in common that's a little scary. They all have significant TMJ issues that have contributed to their malocclusion and, and ultimately why they're in my practice. And so one thing that I really wanna point out and what's scary is you see some faces on there you might not, uh, might not expect from TMD. Today we're gonna to spend a lot of time on this age group of patients. This is an 11 year old patient referred to me just for an orthodontic evaluation. And so from, from my standpoint, you know, whenever I see this and the importance of this is that when we can recognize TMJ issues in a patient this age, we can make such a difference together for the outcome of this patient the rest of their life and really, again, take care of people the way that they should. So on Abram, I wanna zoom in really quickly before we back out. This is his occlusion. You can see he's asymmetric to his right side. His midline's to the right. He's class two on the right side. He's a nice class one on the left side. How often do we all see this patient in our practice? Pretty much every day, right? So my role as an orthodontist as part of our team I really take this seriously. It's not just to uh, see the malocclusion and treat it, but how did this get here? How did this come to it? Is this a joint issue? Is this an airway issue? Uh, did tongue or muscle function influence this? Or is it a genetic biology thing? And more likely than not, this is a combination of several of these things that come together. And it's my job to not just treat this patient, but to identify how it, how it got here. Because if I do that, then I can keep this from coming back. And so, Traditionally, our knowledge in, dental, in the dental field has not been great in this area. How did these patients get here? You know, on growing patients, we talk about these, uh, this as being a one side groom more than the other. We call it unilateral chondrular hyperplasia. Uh, in non-growing patients, as adults, we think of this more as a resorptive phenomenon. You know, we, we call it uh, idiopathic or progressive chondylar resorption. Those are the terms we use. Those are all great and they describe the problem, but quite honestly, it doesn't really define the etiology. Uh, there's been lots of studies. The literature shows you know, predisposing factors. There's a lot of great research that's looked into this kind of phase of things. You know, being female, having hormone influence, nutrition and genetics, those are all things that we know. But again, just kind of showing the predisposition. More importantly, and what I really wanna focus on today is that we've started to look at this from an imaging standpoint. CBCT, MRI, they're all such a part of our lives now that they never used to be. And what, I, what is shocking is that there have been a lot of MRI studies done over the last 20 years that have really focused on patients with TMJ issues. And not just TMJ issues, but, but malocclusion issues. And what they've shown is that these TMJ patients that have had significant traumas and verified disc displacement on their MRI have a very strong correlation to class two skeletal patterns, skeletal open bites, significant uh, asymmetries. And this has been seen in all ages, not just adults. You know, we all think of TMD as, as something that's more of an adult, late teenager, you know, kind of problem that's a pain. What this is all showing is that there are lots of uh, things that we can detect at a structural level early 
uh, for all ages patients. And that's what I want to show you today. So clinical reality of my world as an orthodontist is that 70% of my new patients are class two. I need to know just how many of these patients have a, a joint component to their class two. And ultimately it helps guide my decisions on where I'm going from things. That's why this is so important to me. So after imaging over 100 patients with TMJ uh, MRIs, this is who I see as the new face of TMD. It's not quite what you'd expect, right? This is extremely different of, of what we're talking about. So as we go forward, you know, we all know this guy, the 74-year-old with pain 8 of 10, but what if we could have caught him here, you know, at age 11, no pain? Or this lady, 79 or 71, pain really high on that 10 scale. But again, what if we could have caught her right here? We need to image these patients, and I'll go through my criteria here. So back to Abram, again, referred to me just for spacing concerns and orthodontic eval. On his exam, he had clicking and popping on his left-hand side. No pain, though. You know, no significant pain. This was the first time he'd ever heard of these things, and his parents especially. He'd had a previous motor vehicle accident whenever he was really little. Again, this is, I'm going to talk about trauma today a little bit. It's not a fun subject, but here we go. Uh, here's his bite. You can see that asymmetry to the right. He is almost a full tooth class two on the right versus nice class one on the left side. When we look at his pano, you can see that asymmetry at his condylar heights. And when we look at his cefts, he has a recessive mandible, and he's also deviating to his right with his growth. We'll talk more about what that's doing to his airway in a sec. And just an overall appreciation here, you can really see that chin point to the right. Some people are really good at hiding this. Once we take an image, you can really see this. Whenever we look at his CBCT, very subtle, but his right condyle is a little bit smaller than his, his left side. And whenever we measure, he's a full millimeter, almost millimeter and a half shorter on that right side than his left. This is where his asymmetry is coming from. So whenever we see this in the CBCT world, for me, this is an automatic, I need to look at the soft tissue, and we need to look at that disc on an MRI. Whenever we go to a fully seated condylar position, this is his MRI. You can see on his right side, he is completely anteriorly and laterally displaced versus his left condyle has coverage of the disc. That's pretty ideal. When we go to maximum intercuspation, again, fully anteriorly and laterally displaced on that right side uh, versus the left side that's pretty normal. And finally, this is really important, he does get under the disc at an incisal edge position. I'll show you how I use this information, but this is good. I can use this. And at fully open, again, he's completely covered. So as we go kind of go through his composite, I want to point out a couple things. In his normal everyday functional bite, he does not have coverage of his disc on his right side. That's a very important thing because every day that he's functioning, chewing, he's putting a lot of pressure on that condylar growth site, and it's not able to keep up versus his left side that's more normal, he is. And lastly, with him, and we'll go more into how I treat him in just a second, look at what it's doing to his posterior airway. He has a subnormal airway. His mandible is not developing normally, and everything's hanging back into that airway. What are we setting up this 11-year-old for the rest of his life if we don't do something here for him? Let's go to our second patient. Again, we'll come back to Abram and how I treat him in a second. This is Kaylin. She was 15. She was referred for a jaw asymmetry. Her bite doesn't fit together. She did have uh, clicking and popping at one point, but she said that no longer happens. But now she's starting to get some pain. Just a little bit, though. I kind of had to press her for it. And she had multiple falls and accidents as a child. So whenever we look at her bite, look at that asymmetry to the left. That is definitely a full step class two on the left versus nice class one on the right. When we look at her condyles, her left is dramatically shorter than her right. And you can see again, her mandible's hanging back and she's actually bimaxillary retrusive. Both jaws are not growing forward now at this point and very asymmetric to the left. You can see that again in this next slide, just how asymmetric she really is. When we look at her CBCT, that is a dramatic difference in her left condyle versus right. Just look at that dimension. And as we go forward, she's almost a full two millimeters shorter on that left side. How is this happening? We really need to take a look. And so this is just a composite of her, her left condyle never ever throughout her range of motion gets coverage by that disc. So every time she's functioning, she is putting a lot of pressure there. That condyle can't hang. And so it, we need to know this. Uh, as we look at her airway, again, look at this. She's subnormal again. Both upper and lower jaws are not tracking how they should. So we need to know this as clinicians because if we're going to try and do something for her airway and posture her jaw forward, does she have disc coverage? She doesn't. 
And so we need to know this because what are we putting her at risk for? Potential elevated risk for relapse or pain if we try and advance her on a, on a foundation she doesn't have. And so how do we help these patients? I wanna go back to Abram here, uh, or go through my uh, clinical decisions. I put the MRI is so helpful to me because it puts patients into three categories. If they are growing and they get underneath the disc, I can help them grow, and I'll show you how I did this for Abram. If they are not growing or if they don't get under the disc, then I'm looking at more of a management type situation, somebody that I can keep stable or that we're basically trying to keep them together the rest of their life and not for, for prevent a larger flare-up of their TMJ issue. If they have severe, severe issues such as perforations or complete dislocations such as Kalen, they might also follow into a microsurgical type of intervention circumstance, and I'll show you those cases too. So back to Abram, what did I do for him? I knew that he got under the disc at incisal edge position, so I used that information. This was, you can see his initial measurements, but what I'm gonna show you on the screen is I made him a custom orthotic to, uh, to place him at incisal edge position. You can see he hits and slides forward into that incisal edge position where I knew he was underneath the disc. After one year of wearing this, he wasn't quite ready for full ortho, by the way. After one year of wearing this, on his right side, which was the shorter side, he grew a millimeter and a half. On his left side, which was more normal, he grew about a half a millimeter. Again, I would expect a half a millimeter normal growth, but the fact that we got his right condyle that was lagging on growth protection, now all of a sudden he's skyrocketing back towards where he should be. That is a huge thing. I'll show you another case. This is Sonny. Sonny came in with an asymmetry to the right, about a millimeter difference there. Uh, you can see on his MRI, he gets underneath an incisal edge position, but he's not at any of the other previous positions. So I did the same thing. I built him another custom orthotic to get him where I knew he had protection. And you can see he grew over a millimeter on his right side versus just a little under a millimeter on his left side. Again, I only knew this because I knew where to place him. The MRI told me where to go. And lastly, this is Zalika. Zalika came to me with, a, again, another asymmetry to the right. And you can see whenever I, uh, on her MRI, she gets underneath an incisal edge. So again, another custom orthotic. These cost me 20 bucks to make, by the way. And with digital printing, it's gonna be even less than that. And so I utilized that. And now you see she grew and she is, she is equal on both sides. That asymmetry is no longer here. And so now I've got a level playing field to start my orthodontics and she has a better foundation than when she started. So back to Kaylin, again, she does not get underneath the disc. I know in this circumstance, she's not somebody that I wanna help advance. Because if I advance her, she does not get coverage. That's not a good situation. And again, I elevate her risk for potential pain, relapse, or both for the rest of her life. That's not a good thing. I want to avoid that situation. So how do we recognize these people in our practice? You know, as, as part of their history, the things I look for is, do they ever have a closed lock, pain or no pain? That's an automatic patient that I need to image. Sudden bite changes, especially after ortho, open bites, lat midline changes, or if somebody's had a previous head and neck injury, those are somebody that I need to know about or, and image their joints whenever I'm thinking about changing their occlusion. Whenever I look at clinical signs, that's a long list right there. Anybody that's in the orthognathic surgery ballpark, open bites, full step class two, kids or, no, or, or older, I, the one thing that's a little scary that I found is that midline deviations of just two millimeters. These people have disc displacement very often. You have to look to see and you have to image. The thickness of a disc, by the way, is two millimeters. If we slip off that disc, we're gonna to shift to that side. So you see that, that long list there. There's not a whole lot of ortho patients I see that don't fit into this. Again, this is a huge part of my world and a huge part of everyone's world. On the pano, you can see these things. If they've got asymmetry of their condyles on a pano, or if on their CBCT, you see that they're breaking down. That's a big sign that you need an MRI. Whenever we look at uh, the MRI, if they've got active breakdown, loss of superior joint space, loss of posterior joint space, Whenever you look at medial or lateral joint space, these are all signs and symptoms of disc displacement. We have to know what we're working with. And ultimately, why should we care? This patient on the screen has been to the apex of what we as a dental profession can offer uh, patients. Had orthodontics, orthognathic surgery, cosmetic dentistry. What happened? You see that she's relapsed towards that same side. She has an open bite towards the right side. And when we look at her images, this is her right condyle, breaking down, loss of superior joint space, and where's her disc? It's nowhere to be found. It is anteriorly displaced. 
we've got to know about these things before we go forward with treatment. So again, we all know this lady, uh, pain of eight to 10, but what if we cut a cutter here at 12 with no pain, or even at seven? This is a scary one. This little girl came to me a couple weeks ago. You can see her condyle, her left side condyle on her CBCT, that is actively breaking down. She does not have rheumatoid arthritis. We ruled that out with blood work. But you see where her disc is, that's why. So the bottom line is this affects all of us. Not just me as an orthodontist, but orthognathic surgeons. If we're going into a surgery case, we need to know the stability long-term of this. Restorative dentistry, are, these are the cases that you do a second molar prep and all of a sudden you come back to cement it and they've got a loss of vertical dimension back there. In airway therapy, if we've got a patient that never gets underneath the disc, do we want to advance that patient or are we potentially elevating our risk for getting into some trouble there? So understanding the TMJ Foundation really from my standpoint is the biggest missing link that we've all started to stumble upon. And you know, especially towards predictable treatment planning that we can do for our study clubs and as an interdisciplinary team, this is a huge part of what we should be looking at. We're all in this together. The same way Jeff Rouse talks about we should be screening airway kids uh, at the youngest age possible, we need to be looking at joints patients as soon as possible because we can do so much to help them if we catch this at the right time. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it today and thanks for letting me share. Yeah.